Thanks again for inviting me. This is fun. Um, this paper, as you, as you can see, has two conclusions. First, it's asking a super interesting and relevant effect. Do, uh, do uncertainty as shocks matter for investment? And are these shocks more important when firms face financial frictions? They do this in two ways. They write down a dynamic model, and they show that that's what falls out of the dynamic model. And then they do some empirical work, and they show that coefficients on this instrumented uh, measure of uncertainty are larger for financially constrained firms. This actually echoes this old paper in the Review of Economic Statistics, which was a little bit less focused and not as carefully theoretically oriented, but they should cite that paper. It's, they, you don't forget these, little, these nice little early papers. So I have much to say. I want to spend quite a bit of time outlining the intuition of the model, and then I just have one little um, suggestion for the empirical work. So this sounds like Demetrius's um, discussion. The model has way too many moving parts. Here they are. There are two factors of production. There are two productivity shocks. There's an uncertainty shock. There are two different investment frictions. There are two kinds of debt financing. There's cash accumulation. There's external equity financing. There are five financial frictions. There's a cost of external equity financing. There's costs of issuing both short-term and long-term debt. And there are collateral constraints on both short-term and long-term debt. On top of all of this, there's corporate taxation with a depreciation tax deduction and an interest tax deduction. And as much as I kind of have been known to write down crazy complicated models, this is even too much for me. So what I thought I would do, and, and the other thing is the goal here in this paper is not to estimate the model. The goal is to provide some um, qualitative predictions for empirical work and to pro provide intuition. And in my mind, the intuition right now is a little bit murky. So here's what's going on. They have five financial frictions and they tighten down two of them. Those are the issuance costs on debt and equity. There's this related paper by Gamba and Triantis, and they show that in this kind, of fric this kind of framework, what happens is that there's some financial reshuffling. And so you, then you ask, well, how can this financial reshuffling cause a uncertainty finance multiplier? That's what I want to go into. And I'm going to go into this using a very, very simple model. So here it is. For those of you who like words, there are words. For those of you who like math, there's the math. Pick. OK. So there's a production function. I only have one factor of production. That's capital K. All Latin letters are, are variables. All, all Greek letters are parameters. There's a shock Z, and alpha is less than 1. There are decreasing returns to scale. Z, um, they have capital, so they invest. Investment is defined as tomorrow's capital, K prime. Prime is tomorrow, minus the depreciated value of today's capital. There's the shock. It follows an AR1 process in logs. The only thing non-standard now is the fact that this um, innovation to the process can have one of two variances. The uncertainty, the variance can either be high or low. And then that uncertainty process just follows a two-state Markov process. This is an easy model to solve. You don't need a computer. You can do pencil and paper. It has a closed form solution. And how does this work? So especially if there are no financial frictions and no investment frictions. So what's the firm maximizing? It's maximizing its value. That's profits minus investment plus a continuation value. So I actually did a little, so this was, this is, I, I have much code on my hard drive. It only took about three hours. I did a really little, I picked parameters. I did a baby little SMM on it, except I cheated on the uncertainty shock. I just said, we're going to have the uncertainty shock happen so that high uncertainty happens once every 10 periods. I'll change that later. OK, so now, what does the solution look like? That's the solution. What's on the axis? On the horizontal axis is our various realizations of the log productivity shock. And on the vertical axis is investment. So investment divided by the capital stock. The blue line is low uncertainty. The red line is high uncertainty. And what we see here is that the main result of this very simple model with no frictions is that when there's high uncertainty, the response of investment to a shock is flatter. That makes a lot of sense. And there are very negligible level effects. There's a little bit of the Abel Oil, Abel Oil Hartman thing going on, but not much. OK. One thing to notice here, if you look at the positive productivity shocks, 
investment is higher when there's low uncertainty than when there's high uncertainty. Remember that, that will come back to haunt us. Now, let's add some partial reversibility. So we're gonna add an investment friction. So now the price of capital is one if you buy and it's 85 cents if you sell. And now the policy function for the solution of the model looks like this. So what we've done here by putting in this partial reversibility is we have cut off any action in the low states. They don't want to sell capital because they're getting a lousy price, whether there's high uncertainty or low uncertainty. And you can see in the graph that investment is lower. But the intuition is not quite the real option intuition because in models like this, there aren't projects, there aren't lumps, there's continuous investment. And so the intuition is all about concavity. So in this model, the marginal revenue product of capital is concave in the shock. Why is that? In the low states, the firms don't sell capital, so they're just stuck with their lousy returns. In the high states, they invest, they drive down the marginal product of capital. And so the marginal, product, the marginal revenue product of capital decreases. You have a concave marginal revenue product of capital. A standard Jensen's inequality argument says that you have lower investment. So it's not, it's the, the opposite of the abeloy hartman effect. Okay, now, so now we don't, up to now we have no financing and no financial frictions. Let's add a nice big financial friction. So let, in fact, let's just shut off external finance. So the profit flow now before was just profits minus investment. And let's just restrict that to be positive. And then what happens? It looks like that. So what's going on? It doesn't look like a finance uncertainty multiplier. It looks a little bit like the opposite. So in the low uncertainty states, the firm never wants to invest so much that it has to tap external finance. So the optimal policies look the same. In the low uncertainty states, the firm does invest enough that it might want to tap external finance, but I cut that off. And so the blue line looks like it's starting to go up the nice steep path. And then they hit the constraint and it ah, peters out. And so that's not an investment uncertainty multiplier. It's an anti-multiplier, a divisor. I don't know what the opposite is. So, but, so that's not what's going on in their model. Here's what is going on. You can get this if you have debt and cash. So now I've made the profit flow a little bit more complicated. So I have profits minus investment plus you issue debt, no long-term, short-term, just one. So that's B prime, and then you repay your old debt, that's one plus R bar times B. So if B is positive, that's debt. If B is negative, that's cash. That interest rate on debt, I'm gonna make it lower than the risk-free rate. That gives you something that kinda sorta looks like an interest tax deduction for cheap. And debt's collateralized. So debt is less than some fraction C of the capital stock. Now the model solution is a lot more complicated because it depends on your initial starting point, whether you are in good financial shape to start with or whether you're in bad financial shape to start with. So let's look at those different possibilities. So uncertainty matters more for investment when the firm optimally has a lot of financial slack. So let's say that the parameters of the model are configured in such a way that the firm optimally chooses debt so that it's way below the collateral constraint, i.e. it has a lot of wiggle room. Then the policies look basically just like they did before when I had no financial frictions at all, and that's because when there's a good shock, the firm has all this financial slack and it can use it to invest. So that's pretty straightforward. When, the, when you dink around with the parameters so that it's optimal for the firm to bump up against the collateral constraint, then, the, then you see no difference between the high uncertainty and the low uncertainty states. They look, they're very much similar. And that's because this um, finance constraint really dampens down the upside. Okay. So now, now I've taken you through all these steps. Now we can finally get to the finance uncertainty multiplier. So when does the firm have a lot of financial slack? It has a lot of financial slack when external equity finance is very costly. So if you can't get external finance, then you, re or then you really want to hold a lot of 
cash on hand or keep your debt low or when uncertainty is high. And so that's the sense in the model in which there really is this interesting interaction between external financing costs and uncertainty. So this financial slack channel also operates in, oh, I'm good. So the financial slack channel also operates in the author's much more complicated model. So what they do is they, sh they jack up the debt issuance costs. What that does is it makes the firm hold less long-term debt and actually convert short-term debt into cash, which gives them a lot of financial slack. And so in the low uncertainty states, there's more investment. And of course, all of this blows up if the shocks are persistent. So think about it. What if a shock only shows up once every 10 years? So you see a good shock. You're a business. You see a good shock. You look at the VIX and you say, the VIX is high. That, this shock means nothing. I'm not responding to it. But what if you know that the world oscillates between you know, stable for 10 years and then uncertain for 10 years? In that kind of a world, you respond to these shocks in both the low and high uncertainty states. And so I urge the authors to think a lot more carefully about whether these uncertainty shocks are here today, gone tomorrow, or whether they're persistent. OK. Now on to the empirics. I was pretty unhappy with the uncertainty shocks. It's not a perfect instrument. The no instrument in corporate finance is perfect. On the scale of instruments, it's up there. It's pretty good. So, and the other thing that's nice about that, it's very closely tied to the model. The uncertainty shocks in the model are exogenous, and so they're looking for exogenous variation in uncertainty in the data. So that's nice. But the authors punt on measuring financial frictions. So their main measure is this um, thing from this Randuchin paper where you're constrained if you have positive debt and no S&P um, rating, which is kind of endogenous and also doesn't make sense. What if these firms are just great bank customers and not financially constrained? That's another possibility. The other thing is that this measure has nothing to do with the financial slack intuition. If you're using a lot of debt, you might actually be up against a constraint. You might not have a lot of financial slack. So it's not obvious to me that this actually gets at what the author's model predicts. And the reason why they punt is because there are no good options. It's a re measuring financial constraints is really hard. Let me list all of the very bad options. So the, fir the f two worst options are in the first bullet po point. So the Kaplan and Zagalis index and the White and Win Win index are, were estimated on data sets that end respectively in 1984 and 2002. Enough said. OK, we're done with that. Um, there's this Hadlock and Pierce measure based on age and size. That might be a little bit better. They actually read some annual reports to figure out what was going on. So that's, that's not horrible. What else is there? Oh, yeah, Alexander Lundquist likes to look at tax changes. So that limits your sample. And it's also theoretically not obvious whether that's the right thing to do or not. And then there are some narrative approaches. So Hoberg and Maximovich do textual analysis of annual reports. That's another alternative. So what do you do when you have an interesting question and you have a whole bunch of really lousy alternatives? Empirically, just take some very rough cuts at the data and don't, no Paul Krugman, Krugman pictures. You, you're not getting any exogenous variation here, but just be very measured in how you describe your results. That would be my suggestion. So this is an interesting question. And I think the, uh, the empirical results are interesting. All I would urge the authors to do is keep the model simple and intuitive and try to find a better measure of financial constraints.